this part two of chapter one. We're going to talk a little bit about your EM, EMR life support kit or your first aid kit. In the ambulance, you'll call it a jump bag. And there's a variety of supplies that you want to think about, uh, including in these. You can buy a commercial kit. It has um, everything that you need and probably a little bit more. If you work for a service that allows you to supply your kit from their um, inventory, um, that's fabulous. If you don't, uh, I can always give you a list that, that uh, you can build your own first aid kit. And as far as a container to carry, I really recommend um, uh, for the cost and what you're going to put in it, um, a fishing tackle box, uh, not one that you pull out that, you know, it's got dead worms and everything in there forever, but um, buy one new. They're not that expensive. You don't even have to buy a really expensive one. Um, you know, less than $20 investment, and it's got the slots for everything that you have. The other reason I really like the, the tackle boxes, uh, you can label it, first aid kit and everything, but then um, if it's in your trunk or in the back of your SV, SUV or whatever, you can throw gear on it and it doesn't uh, crush anything in there. It's pretty sturdy. You're going to have to improvise. You won't always have exactly the equipment and the supplies that you need. Uh, you just have to stand behind what you used. Uh, for instance, if somebody's hiking and they broke an ankle, it, it's up to you if you want to use a, a stick or a limb or something like that to support that leg and immobilize it. You just have to be able to justify it uh, to the responders that are coming. You know, Could that have waited five more minutes for them to put an appropriate splint on? Because they're just going to take that one off and put something else on. Uh, improvising is always good. Um, I like to you know, talk about austere environments and what you would do. Uh, you just have to remember that they're going to be going to the hospital and they'll probably be repackage uh, what you used without appropriate resources. You're going to work in a variety of settings. And while I don't teach the test, I teach you to be a good MR in the field, I want to remind you that the National Registry exam that you take is written for all states and territories of the United States. So they're going to pose questions that, uh, you know, they'll say a cold um, January day, and we're thinking, oh, what is that, like 32? No, they're talking about sub-zero with wind chills of minus 20. Or a very, you know, hot summer day, we're thinking 106, and they're thinking 84 with high humidity. So you kind of have to, to think about this on a regional basis. If you go to work in high elevations or uh, sea level where you have... Um, Portuguese man of war and jellyfish things. You have to know what to do. So this course encompasses all of that. Roles and responsibilities. Uh, make sure that you're ready to go at all times. If you're, you know, on shift or, or on call that, you know, you can jump in at a moment's notice and go. Make sure the scene is safe. So your number one role is to protect yourself. You can't be any good to the patient if you're injured uh, and your team will stop what they're doing to take care of you. So I always say, I am the most important person on the ambulance, my partner is second, the patient is third, and bystanders and other people are around or later, but I'm still responsible for them. Uh, make sure that you're safe, uh, you go home, you're a hero to your family more than a hero to your community. Make sure you have the appropriate re resources available to you. So if you can't do something, if, if a car is sitting on the edge of a cliff, you know, don't access that patient. Make sure it's uh, stabilized before you do that. You're going to be performing patient assessments. If you don't like other people touching you, you'll get used to it when we do our patient assessment because we have to touch and feel our patients. Um, administer appropriate medical care based on that finding. Know when to move them and, and how to do so safely and how to get help from bystanders as needed. You're going to control your scene. You're going to control every part of that scene. So you may have to eliminate bystanders. You may have to call uh, law enforcement to protect your scene. Uh, but you control your scene. When other resources arrive on scene, whether it be law enforcement or EMS or whatever, then you turn that responsibility over to them. You want to maintain uh, continuity of care by assisting the EMTs and paramedics in the ambulance as they arrive. Make sure you have good documentation and keep your knowledge and skills up to date. You don't want to be the weak link of your organization. Documentation is very important. With the advent of electronic PCRs, we're now typing our computer reports, and they're, it's great that they have uh, drop-down boxes so we don't forget anything that we need to have in there. 
uh, based on you know our findings and, and treatment for the patient. This is going to be a legal document that is included in the continuum of care of that patient. And what that means is the receiving hospital, the surgeon, the rehab tech, everybody that comes in contact with that patient is going to rely on the same things that you see, heard, smelt, and touched at the scene that they didn't get to see. So you want to paint a good picture of what that looks like so that that, that information is very useful to all those people uh, involved in the care of that patient. Attitude and contact. Conduct. And this is probably one of your biggest roles and responsibilities. I know you probably took this class to help other people, and I want you to remember that as you continue your years uh, with your EMS service. So your patient is looking for somebody with, with integrity that empathizes how they feel. This is not their best day, and you're there to make it a little bit better, hopefully the outcome better too. So you want to be motivated to use your skills and your training to the utmost for their benefit, not for yours. You always want to be an advocate for your patient, putting their needs before yours. And while this seems like uh, something that's not that important, if you're awoken in the middle of the night for a call and you have a rooster tail hair thing going on, uh, you still want to appear neat and professional at all times. Not shirt tails out, not caps on backwards. You represent not only your organization, but you represent the whole part of EMS and your reflection on all of us. As the team leader of your EMS, it's going to be the medical director, a physician extender who allows you to provide care in your area. So most of the communication with your physician is going to be offline. They'll direct your training courses such as this one. We have medical director oversight. Uh, set your policies and procedures, which we call protocols, and make sure that everything is the utmost quality. Occasionally, you'll contact your medical director or the receiving physician at the hospital, depending on your arrangement, for medical direction, you may have a patient who doesn't want to go to the hospital and you're like, man, I really want this guy to go. Well, let me call the hospital that we would have taken him to. Or if you have the luxury of having a 24-hour available medical director, let me contact him or her and see what they say about this. Uh, get some advice from, from the medical director. And that's called online medical control. All, all facets of EMS are going to be reviewed. What we're doing, is it good? Can we make it better? We want to look at the six components, which are safety, the effectiveness of our care, being patient-centered, uh, times. We look at times a lot. What, you know, what was the shoot time from leaving the station? Why was it five minutes at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Uh, if we have a lot of call pendings, maybe we need to bring in another crew. Uh, how efficient were we with our care, uh, not wasting supplies, and treating all patients as the same, as if we're colorblind, we're economically blind, you know, we're treating their, their emotional and physical needs rather than who and uh, we want to select to treat. Some information on your certification. Once you're certified um, nationally, then you'll need to obtain state certification in order to work in the state of Texas with an EMS provider. So it's your responsibility to keep all that information current uh, through continuing education, skills practice, and um, even keeping your certification current, you know, you have to check from time to time to make sure that doesn't expire. In your national registry, uh, you're uh, certified by them for two years. Every EMR will expire in September. Others, EMT and up, will expire in March uh, for two years. So you can renew by taking the exam again or completing CE or a refresher course. And that's only $10. But remember, you have to maintain your Texas ECA to work in the state of Texas. So from the time of the date that it's acquired, all of us will have different months that we expire. Um, you need to remove, renew about three months ahead of time, put in all your paperwork, and most of it's electronic now. Um, you can maintain your national registry and just uh, submit, you know, check that box that I, here's my NR number. Uh, you can renew by continuing education, which is what most of us do, or you can take the state test, not the National Registry test, but the state test. It is $64 renewal unless you're volunteer exempt, which means you do not get paid for your affiliation with your service. Uh, and January 1st, 2017, Department of State Health Services is going to include a rules test fee, so they'll have some venue for us to go online and look at those rules um, that apply to EMS. Some of them I've covered here, 
uh, and that fee will be up to $40. I don't know if it's going to be waived for volunteers or not. Um, this is still kind of in its planning stages. A little bit on the summary, things that you should do, um, things that you shouldn't do as an EMR. So this is a, just a brief overview of the whole EMS system. So as we get into more chapters, we break it down more specifically. The sequence of events from the time the injury happens till the time they arrive at the hospital. Uh, documentation uh, on your part is part of that continuum of care, so it needs to be very organized. The leader of your medical team is the medical director. And uh, quality uh, improvement looks at different facets of our care to make sure that what we're doing is good, what we're not doing well, we improve, and that we always look to do better. The MR. So this is a nice little review. At the end of your chapters in your book, you have um, multiple choice questions such as these that you can go over and answer, as well as your um, online resources that, that will help you master this material. What I like to do with a test question is read it all the way through and every answer say is that true or false. So here it says the EMR must possess the ability to A, treat patients using limited re equipment, and that is true. Perform ALS level skills, that's false. Keep severely injured patients alive for extended periods of time. Extended makes that word, that answer false. And diagnose, that one word makes that whole thing wrong. We do not diagnose, we give a field impression. So treat patients using limited equipment would be the correct answer. For a patient in cardiac arrest, which of the following interventions would you most likely be responsible for performing? Remember, advanced life support does in invasive um, treatments, and we do not at the EMR level with the exception of electricity. So administration of pain meds, IV therapy, and intubation would all be ALS, CPR, and defibrillation would be basic life support. When EMTs or paramedics arrive on scene, do you just say, hey, I'm done, I'm out of here? Or do you prepare to accompany them? Maybe, let's hang on to that one. Assist the higher level EMS providers in continuing care. That's a better answer than B. So B was okay until I saw C, and I like that one better. Obtain signatures, no, not really. Correct answer, C. So this concludes